invitation. It's always a pleasure to speak in St. Petersburg, even virtually, and I hope that soon it will be possible again to, to speak in person. Uh, so, uh, I would like to say first several words about Mariam, and actually I would like to say several words why Mariam. We have many brilliant colleagues, math one mathematicians, so why, why Mariam? Uh, well, she said that she's a slow thinker and it takes time for her to, to clean up ideas and make progress. Actually, mathematical, mathematical community is made of slow thinkers. It takes to mathematical community some time to, uh, to understand, to digest, to follow their depth of ideas of new results. And when something new is done, usually you can see that, well, it is really interesting and bright instantly. But after a while, you, when you go deeper in the result, you can realize that it's sort of more superficial than you expected, or on the contrary, you can realize that it's much deeper than you, you first thought about it, and that it's a new vision of, of the field and new vision of things. And to my mind, what characterizes the results of Mariam is that she really, in many aspects, she, she suggested a new vision of things, and Actually, it took the mathematical community about 10 years to really start to understand her results. And the applications are appearing now one after another. And to name some of them, I can say that to my mind, the first very important insight in what is now called topological recursion is, was made by Mariam. Uh, the recent results of Agarwal on asymptotics of witten kansevich correlators uh, were sort of, sort of planified by Mariam. Uh, there is a current project of Nalini Anantaraman and Laura Monk, and to my mind, uh, mathematical community will speak soon a lot, about, a lot about it. And it is very much based on uh, ideas and results and, and thoughts of Mariam, uh, their recent results on classification of invariant submanifolds in the model A space uh, of abelian differentials by the action of SL2R due to Paula Pisa and Alex Wright, and this was the project started with Mariam. And our results, um, they would be presented, so I will tell some, some, something about them in my talk, and then Elise Bougeard will tell more about Neanders. Actually, this was also in the plans of Mariam. Uh, together with Vincent de la Croix, Elise Bougeard, and Petya Zardov, we are working on this project for the last five years. And I have to say that we have a constant feeling that uh, we're sort of in a uh, mountain expedition. And there is, every time we, we make an advance, we see that there is a camp prepared by Mariam, and the, there is a hood prepared by Mariam. There is, some, somehow she, she designed many, many paths and many projects and she just didn't have time to, to perform them. Uh, tomorrow she would turn 44, so she passed away when she was, she, she just turned 40. So she had plenty of ideas and she brought really incredible insight to, to mathematics and she just didn't have time to realize it. So this is one of the reasons why Mariam. Another reason is more personal, well, other reasons. I would say that Mariam, for me personally, is one of the most fearless and daring persons in mathematics. So in usual life, she was extremely modest. And if you would come to a conference at which she participated, so if a stranger would come to a conference, not knowing who is Mariam here. To my mind, it was impossible to guess that this girl who had the look of a 
graduate student or at most postdoc and who was all but snobbish and extremely accessible and, and simple, that that's the, the winner of Fields Medal and so on. So in, in usual life, it was like this. However, in mathematics, she was really fearless and, de and, and daring. So in her thesis, she used, she combined five or six recent developments of mathematics, which are mostly known to only to experts. And she managed to, to learn them fast and to, to combine them fast. And instead of speaking about the thesis and these results, I would cite a story which I know from Kazar Rafi. Uh, so Mariam and Roy Beheshti were two, the two first girls in Iranian team of International Olympiad. And of course, there is a serious preparation. So Kazar Rafi uh, is about two years older. So he was already at the first, probably at the first year of university. He was uh, among those who prepared the team for Olympiad. And at some point he suggested the problem for which he didn't know the solution neither. And a week later, Mariam came back with a solution. The solution used complex analysis. And this time, Kazra, I, I think he was at the first year, he didn't have yet a course of complex analysis. So he had to go to the library and to take a book in complex analysis. It took him a week to learn all necessary stuff. And then he was able to read the solution and, and it was absolutely correct. So he came back to Mariam and asked, how do you know complex analysis? And Mariam honestly said, I don't know complex analysis at all. But at some point I've seen either a popularization article or something, anyway, some source, where there was a passage which resembled her the problem. So she managed to uh, chop the necessary piece from this tape or whatever, project it to the problem she needed, and without reading books on complex analysis, use complex analysis, just, just a piece of it, which she really needed. And, and the solution was absolutely correct. So she had no fear that, oh no, I don't know complex analysis. I have first to read introduction, then all the axioms, chapter one, chapter two. No, she was able to project unknown mathematics instantly. So, and this is wonderful. And to my mind, this is the way to, to do mathematics. And one more thing is that she was really incredibly, incredibly nice person. Uh, I would like to finish this presentation of Mariam as a person by the following story. Uh, at some point I was asked by French Mathematical Society and by American Mathematical Society to read some word, to, to write some words about results of Mariam. And at the last moment, I was asked to, for, for a picture of Mariam. So I wrote to Mariam asking to send me a picture and I got this picture like five minutes later. And I like this picture very much. You see, for me, it is exactly the picture which represents Mariam because on the one hand, you see there the main objects of her research, Riemann surfaces, and even more, these Riemann surfaces are not are quite interesting. So there are some parts which are there slightly degenerate. So that's a stable curve and so on. And also to my mind, Mariam really always had this openness, interest to, to everything which is so typical for children and which is rare for becomes more and more rare to adults. To my mind, the best researchers, very sincere and various well, best researchers are, are children. And then five minutes, another five minutes later, I got a message from Mariam. Oh, Anton, I'm sorry. I confused the, the pictures. It's the birthday party of Anahita, uh, her daughter. And so, so the picture was replaced, but I know that this is an Ahito on the picture. And still, I have to say that for me, Mariam remained like this. And probably the last word about, I, I plan to say this and I forgot to tell, when I told that Mariam was really somehow not disconnected from reality person, despite the fact that she was really incredible mathematician and that 
she was somehow uh, not snobbish. So this is a story of Kurt McMullen, which was her scientific advisor, who is a uh, winner of Fields Medal himself. So he was asked to present results of Mariam at the International Mathematical Congress when she got her medal. Uh, he was quite anxious on the way he selected to the results and the way he is presenting them. So when he was giving his presentation, he was looking from time to time at Mariam, trying to see what would be her reaction, whether she's happy, whether she's unhappy and so on. And after a while, she re he realized that Mariam is not following the presentation at all. She was completely occupied and happy with Anahita, who was sitting on her knees, and they were murmuring something and so on. So, so, so Anahita meant a lot of, for Mariam, and, and her family meant a lot, and her friends meant a lot. Okay, so now when I have said several words about Mariam, let me sp say several words about her mathematics, and I will start with presentation of uh, some results in geometry and topology, and I would like to ask asp experts not to be crazy with me because I'm, I would be extremely elementary because this talk is supposed to be addressed to a broad audience. So let me remind, remind you first what is a hyperbolic surface. When we have a smooth orientable surface of genus at least two, we can choose on this surface a metric of constant negative curvature. Usually one chooses as constant negative curvature, curvature minus one. And this is a surface which locally has a shape of a chips. So it's a saddle like this. So if you cut a piece of your surface, it would exa have exactly shape like this. Uh, now, if we allow to the surface to have cusps, one can construct hyperbolic metric even on a sphere and the torus as schematically presented on the picture. Do not take these pictures seriously. This is schematic pictures. It's not a true embedding into R3. Now, the main object of the discussion today is a curve on a surface. So I will consider only simple curves, the curves which don't have self-intersections, and also considering curves on a hyperbolic surface, it is particularly interesting to consider, to, to assume that they're essential. So we wouldn't consider curves which border a small disk and curves which border a cusp because we will pretend that all our curve, all our curves are made from elastic um, cords and that they want to shrink along the surface. And if a curve borders a disk, it would shrink to a point. And if a curve borders a cusp, it would shrink and go up to the cusp. And if not, if the curve is essential, then it is known that it would shrink and would take, sorry, it would take a shape of a geodesic in this hyperbolic metric. And as a matter of fact, if the initial curve was non-self-intersecting, then it is known that uh, the resulting geodesic would be non-self-intersecting non either. So formally, mathematically, in a free homotopy type of any simple closed essential curve, there is a unique hyperbolic geodesic whatever is the metric of constant negative curvature. Now, let me, so it was a reminder of geometry, which I will need. Now let me say something about topology. Forget for a while about hyperbolic metric, it does not exist anymore. Uh, we will say that two simple closed curves on a smooth surface have the same topological type. If you can find a diffeomorphism of a surface which sends one curve to another. Actually, surfaces have extremely rich group of diffeomorphisms. Now, it follows immediately from the classification theorem of surfaces that there is a finite number of topological types of simple closed curves. Actually, if there are no cusps, I can tell you instantly what are these topological types. So the curve, simple closed curve, can separate the surface or not. And if it does not separate, 
this is the only topological type. If it separates, it separates into pieces which have different genera, and this is the genera on each of the sides of this, of each side of the of the curve, are the classifying invariants. One can consider slightly more general object instead of considering a single simplest, simple closed curve. One can consider primitive multicurves. One can consider a collection of pairwise disjoint non-homotopic simple closed curve, curves. So you consider a multi-component simple closed curves and simple closed curve, and you assume that for a primitive multicurve that the uh, two components are not homotopic. So for any fixed pair genus and number of cusps, there is a finite number of primitive multicurves on the surface of genus G with n punctures with n cusps. Now, for for example, for genus two and no cusps, the picture on this slide shows all possible topological types of simple closed curves, and there is nothing else. Uh, it is somehow un slightly unusual because our intuition is biased by the consideration of homology. And I insist that here we do not work with the first homology. For example, uh, the simple closed curve, which is on the surface on the bottom left corner of this picture, this one, uh, from the point of view of homology, it is a zero cycle. It, it separates the surface into two pieces. It's homologous to zero. And for us, it is an interesting and important topological type of a simple closed curve. Uh, on the other hand, consi consider, for example, this simple closed curve, which is non-separating, and the one which is in the middle of the surface on the right bottom picture, so this one. So forget about the two on the side, so I temporarily forget about these ones, and I consider only the simple closed curve, which is here in the middle. It is non-separating, so according to my theorem, it is in the same topological type as this simple closed curve. And actually, it might at the beginning seem strange, but if you chop your surface, if you cut it by this simple closed curve, what you get is a torus with two boundary components, and every two tori with two holes are diffeomorphic. Then you just adjust your diffeomorphism close to the boundary, and you see that you can find a diffeomorphism of a surface of genus two, which sends this simple closed curve to the simple closed curve, which is in the middle of this picture. And for experts in geometry, I can say that this topological types of primitive simple, well, of primitive multicurves have a nice geometric meaning. If you shrink completely your black curves, then you get degenerate surfaces, which for geometers are called stable curves. So basically, these six pictures encode six boundary classes of their delin mumford compactification of the model A space of services of genus two for this particular picture. Okay, now one more object, one more actor of the play is the mapping class group, which is the group of diffeomorphism, diffeomorphisms of closed smooth orientable surface of genus G. Uh, I will quotient this all diffeomorphisms by diffeomorphisms which are homotopic to identity. And the resulting group is called mapping class group. Uh, one can consider also mapping class group in the presence of cusps, or if you prefer, you can consider them as punctures. And when they are punctures, traditionally one enumerates them. So one associates labels one, two, three, etc., up to N. And one requires that the mapping class group respect the labeling. So cusp number one is sent to cusp number one by diffeomorphisms and so on. Okay, now I prepared 
everything to tell the way we will treat, treat multicurves. I already tried to explain that homology, it's extremely nice structure. I love homology, but in this particular case, it is not quite appropriate because it ignores interesting curves. There is also fundamental group, another structure, which enables to study closed curves, but fundamental group is rather designed to study closed curves no matter whether they're self-intersecting or not. And we're interested separately in non-self-intersecting curves. So Bill Thurston invented yet another structure, which is designed exactly to study simple closed multicurves. And in many aspects, this structure resembles the first homology, but there is no group structure. And I should say that it is sort of widely unknown to mathematical community, and this is a beautiful structure. Um, well, the way one treats a general multi-curve in this structure is as follows. Suppose you have a general multi-curve, and general, I'm not assuming anymore that it is primitive, reduced, so there might be there are no self-intersections, but I do not assume anymore that components of this multi-curve are not homotopic between each other. I assume that there are no components homotopic to identity. This is not interesting, but there might be some components which are homotopic between, between each other. So then I apply an appropriate diffeomorphism to the surface and I unwrap the surface in a complicated way to unwrap my extremely sophisticated multi-curve to something which is simpler, something which is simpler, which is as on this left picture in the bottom. So now I see that my multi-curve has six connected components. There are three connected components which are homotopic to each other, so in free homotopy. So I can deform one to another. There is one more which is non-homotopic to the first group and there are two more which are homotopic between each, other, with each other. And this one in the middle is separating and the guys on the left and on the right are non-separating. And I encode this multi-curve by the following way. When there are several connected components homotopic to each other, I just memorize the number of components by weight. So I reduced, I by diffeomorphism not produced, I sent my multi-curve to a simply a multi-curve, which is three gamma one plus gamma two plus two gamma three. And now to this already simplified multi-curve, I can associate reduced multi-curve forgetting about these weights. So I replace weight three by one, I replaced weight two by one, and I obtain one of the six topological types of multi-curves as on the previous picture. So this is the way we sort of unwrap our multi-curves. And if we do not, and yeah, sorry. And I forgot to, so I, I have to say that in certain natural piecewise linear coordinates, integral multi-curves are represented by integer points of a conical polytope, sort of in the way integer homology, homology cycles are represented by lattice points in a vector space. Except that now it is not quite a vector space. So we have this piece linear, piecewise linear structure. It is, we also have action of homotopy. We can scale everything by a factor of 10, 1000 or whatever. And we have this integer point. So you can, so I tried in this picture represent sort of a, uh, you, you, it is a two-dimensional object, so it's a two-dimensional uh, conical polytope, and you have to imagine that all these points are on the surface of this polytope. And I colored them into colors because I try to mimic the situation that one color correspond to one topological type, so you start with a basic multi-curve and then 
you act with the mapping class group and you create more and more complicated multi-curves. And another color corresponds to the orbit of another topological type under the action of the mapping class group. So, for example, for surface of genus two, I would color, I can color everything into six colors corresponding to the six base, basic primitive multi-curves. And now, since we have this piecewise linear structure, we have an analog of an integer lattice, and we have action of the homothesis, we can define the natural measure associated to this structure. If you want to measure uh, uh, in this, for this picture, if you want to measure an area of a small domain on the surface of this polytope, you do the following thing. You do exactly the same thing as we were taught in uh, elementary school. You rescale everything by a factor million. Then you count how many integer points got inside your figure. And it's like we measured in the elementary school areas of figures by counting the number of points of a ruled, putting the figure on a ruled paper and counting how many squares got inside. So here it's the same. We count how many points after rescaling got inside, inside some figure. Then we normalize by the scaling factor which we used and we pass to, to the limit when we make scaling factor 10 to infinity. This is called Thurston measure. And now I prepared everything. Now I can tell the one of the main counting results of Maria Mirzahan. So this picture is taken at uh, CIRM at Lumini. It is close to Marseille. Uh, the person whose face you do not see on the right is Greg McShane. Uh, so the Greg McShane, which is McShane's identity, which was one of the starting points for, for the work of Mariam. And the picture is taken by Francois Laboury, which is another colleague of, of Mariam. So now I combine together geometry and topology. If we have a simple closed multi-curve, in the presence of hyperbolic metric, I can let contracted components to close geodesics. And as a matter of fact, it is known that they would not intersect between, they wouldn't self-intersect, not neither intersect between each other. And in the presence of hyperbolic metric, I will fix for a while a hyperbolic metric and I will consider it as a parameter. So in the presence of hyperbolic metric, I can measure the length of all these components. So in this way to any multi-curve, even with weights, I can associate a length. Namely, I let if each component shrink to a simple closed geodesic, I measure the length of the corresponding simple closed geodesic. And then I take the linear combination of length with the same coefficients which, are, which were present in the multi-curve. And in this way, I associate their length to, uh, to every multi-curve. And then I can count the number of multi-curves uh, of given topological type gamma of length at most L. In terms of this picture, sorry, uh, length L gives me some bounded region of this conical polytope and I count how many points of given topological type, namely how many, for example, red points, got inside this bounded region. Then I change L, I get a larger bounded region, and I count a new number of red points which go to this new bounded region. And then I let L tell to infinity, making this bounded region uh, grow, and I'm interested in asymptotics of this number. So. I'm interested in asymptotics of this number, which is the number of points of the number of multi-curves of given topological type gamma, uh, which have length at most L in hyperbolic metric X. And here's the theorem of Mirzakhan. She proved that this number grows as length to the power of 6g minus 6 plus 2n, 
where G is the genus of the surface and N is the number of cusps. And what is wonderful is that the coefficient in this polynomial asymptotic has very nice structure. Namely, it is decomposed into several pieces where one factor, this factor, depends only on hyperbolic metric and doesn't know anything about the topological type of the curve. The factor C of gamma knows nothing about hyperbolic metric and records only topology of the topological type of simple closed curve, of simple of multi-curve. And BGN is a global, is a constant which depends only on genus and n. Each of these constants has its own geometric meaning. Each of them is computable. In particular, there is a, an explicit formula for C of gamma. So this is the counting result, which is wonder, wonderful by itself because, well, geometers love to count closed geodesics. But if you count all closed geodesics, well, most of closed geodesics self intersect on the surface. And the growth rate is exponential. They are much more. So simple closed geodesics are extremely rare among all closed geodesics. And it is sort of difficult to count rare objects. And another, curl, well, when another consequence of this result is the following corollary. Fix any hyperbolic metric on the surface of genus G with n cusps. And I insist any. Uh, consider any two rational multicurves, gamma 1 and gamma 2, on this, sur on this surface, uh, considered up to the action of the mapping class group. Otherwise, consider two topological types of multicurves. And count how many multi-curves of the first type of length at most L you find on this surface, how many multi-curves of type two and length at most L on this surface you can find, and take the ratio and pass to the limit. The resulting limit does not depend on hyperbolic metric and it is seen by the structure of this coefficient. The factor which depends on the metric is common and what would disappear how, when we will divide one over the other. So the frequencies of multi-curves of different topological types depend, does not de do not depend on hyperbolic metric. And I should say that somehow I already showed you a picture which sort of explains why this is true. But when you see this theorem for the first time, at least for me, I had to reread this theorem several times because I could not believe my eyes. Because it's obvious somehow for the, at the beginning that it cannot be true. Because the statement is not for almost all hyperbolic metric. The statement is for any hyperbolic metric. And when it says for any, well, I can construct extremely peculiar hyperbolic metrics on surfaces of genus G. I can consider a cyclic cover, for example, over a surface of lower genus, and the surface which I will, I will construct will have a lot of symmetries. So the length spectrum of geodesics will have the same symmetries, and it will be very, very peculiar. How can this very special surface can have the same properties as any other? Well, it can, and this is there is nothing wrong with this theorem. And moreover, one can compute these frequencies. For example, consider six punctual sphere. So sphere with six cusps. We agreed and consider only, forget temporarily about multi-curves, let's consider simple closed curves. Uh, we agreed that we do not consider multi-curves, well, simple closed curves which are contractible or which go around one cusp. So any interesting simple closed curve from our point of view, have to have at least two cusps on one side and at least two cusps on the other side. When there are six in the total, there are only two options, three plus three and two plus four. So Mariam computed how frequent are simple closed curve of the first type and how frequent are simple closed curve of the other type and the ratio is four thirds. 
Maria made her computation in 2008. At this time, she didn't have any databases or comparison with any other uh, computations. Her results were checked recently by several different ways. And these four thirds were confirmed and they're absolutely correct. So the idea why these frequencies do not depend on hyperbolic metric is in this schematic picture. When actually the frequencies are the frequencies of points of red type or blue type on this conical polytope. And when we use one hyperbolic metric, we construct one type of bounded region to compute these frequencies. And then we make this blue region grow. And we have more and more points of blue type and red type. And eventually we compute the frequencies of this red and blue type. If we choose another metric, we just change the shape of this bounded region. But we do not change morally, it is visible that we do not change the frequencies with which occur, appear um, red points and blue points. We can choose just, we can choose any reasonable sequence of growing bounded regions to compute this limit and we'll get the same number. I'm definitely oversimplifying the result of Mariam because what is non-trivial here, one of the things which is non-trivial here is it is sort of, it is possible to use the erotic theorem proved by Howard Mazur many years ago to prove that asymptotic densities of these red points and blue points exist. It is not obvious at all why these asymptotic densities are non-zero. This is one thing and even less trivial is to compute them explicitly. And Murray improved all of this. And also she had to prove some uniform estimates uh, to change the order of limits and so on. And it requires a lot of work and it was all but trivial. And also what I'm hiding in is the explicit formula for this coefficient C of, for this coefficient C of gamma, allowing to compute this exact numbers for thirds, for example. Okay, now we have this wonderful result. Let us try to discuss it and see what does it mean for multi-curves. We can define, using this picture, we can define random multi-curves. We can take a very large bounded region and then take by random a point among finite collections of points which get to this bounded region and discuss whether a random point belongs to blue orbit or to red orbit, for example. From the geometric point of view, we can say that we take a random multi-curve on the surface of genus two. It has the form M1, gamma one, etc., MK, gamma K, as we have seen on the picture. And we can consider the associated reduced multi-curve and we can ask all possible geometric questions about the stru structure of reduced multi-curve of, of coefficients of everything. For example, as for six punctured sphere, we can discuss which simple closed curve are more frequent, the separating ones or non-separating ones. So Mariam also made a computation of the frequencies of separating and non-separating and she obtained one over six, which was cited for 10 years in basically every talk about her results. Now, if you look at attentively at Mariam's calculation, then you see that there is a tiny bug at some point, instead of putting two in denominator, she puts it into to nominate, to numerator. So you see that it's one over 24. And after correcting one more bug, which is less visible, you get one over 48. I should say that when we have obtained in a similar context, not exactly in this context, context, but in a similar context, one over 48, at this time we already had a strong suspicion that we're computing, counting very similar objects, but it was different from one over six. So I should say that I was extremely nervous. I didn't want to, to speak about it much. So we asked many people to make a, a computation somehow 
Now, by now, it is confirmed by about a dozen of different computations. And I'm showing this not to somehow diminish results of Marion. On the contrary, she made her computations without comparing to any databases. In 10 years, there were a lot of advance in different areas, in particular due to ideas of Mariam. And only 10 years after results of Mariam, people started to, to use not only ideas, but to use numbers, to, to use some concrete applications. So this is just a confirmation that mathematical community started to really re use intensive results of Mariam with a lot of delay in a sense. So only now, and now they're they are flourishing and, and there is a burst of, of results in, in this direction. So I already showed you all possible topological types of simple closed, oh, sorry, of primitive multi-curves on the surface of genus two. And here are the, the answers. So if you take a, a, a general multi-curve on the surface of genus two, then unwrap the surface to make it take easier shape and take the underlying reduced curve, then the numbers here show the probabilities to get one of the six types. So if you sum up all the six numbers, you get one. So this is sort of the probabilities of multi-curves of different types. This is a short table, six types, six explicit rational numbers. But the trouble is that in genus three, there would be already 41 types. In genus four, there would be 378. And in genus five, there would be four and a half thousand types of multi-curves, of primitive multi-curves. So one can produce a table, but if I will give you a table of four and a half thousand pictures with explicit values of probabilities, you would say that there is no way to use my table. There's no point to, to, to create such big tables and the, table, the size of the table grows faster than exponentially when genus tends to infinity. So let's discuss what can be done in large genus. Uh, suppose that here the picture is still of genus two, but suppose that the genus is large and I want to discuss what shape has a, multi a, a random multi-curve on the surface of large genus. What is the number of components? What is the number of what are the, the weight, typical weights and so on? What is the typical shape of around the multi-curve? And one of the questions is whether it's possible to extract from this enormous table of possible topological types, some subcollection which is as small as possible, uh, such that with probability which is close to one, a random multi-curve belongs to this subcollection. So, <laughs> To keep you for 30 more seconds in suspension, I would like to introduce the very last object of this talk. This is a square tile surface. So this is a true square tile surface. I have it my, in my hands. So one can actually for a long time, we were interested in square tile surfaces and, multi, and not in multi-curves, feeling that the two objects are very close to each other. And one can discuss also what is there shape of a random square tile surface. I give you zillion squares. I ask you to create a square tile surface of genus G from zillion of squares. There is a finite number of ways to create them. And I ask, what is the shape of a random square tile surface? One of the questions is as follows. So the elementary bricks of square tile surfaces are horizontal cylinders. Uh, so I'm not, so this, this part of the surface is a flat cylinder. There is another flat cylinder here. There is another flat cylinder here. So there is another flat cylinder here. One can count what is the number of these maximal cylinders and what is the typical number, whether they are usually many, whether they're not so many. So the first theorem is that the probability to get a multi-curve such that underlying primitive multi-curve has exactly k components. I'm fixing the genus of the surface and I'm assuming that genus is large. 
So this probability is exactly the same probability, just exactly, the, sorry, here I even do not assume that genus is large for any genus. The asymptotic probability to get exactly K components for a random multi-curve is exactly the same as asymptotic probability to get K maximal cylinders for a square tile surface, random square tile surface of the same genus. This is the first result, just tying two classes of objects. So every result about random multi-curves can be translated in the language of random square tile surfaces. And now the answer, what is the shape? I can give the answer, what is the shape of a random multi-curve? And I'm almost, almost finished. Actually, if you represent your surface of genus G as sphere with G handles, then the reduced multicurve underlying a random, a random multicurve on the surface of genus G has just several connected components, several which is bounded between this 0.09 log G and 0.62 log G with probability which tends to one. And these connected components as cycles, they just go around distinct handles. So as cycles, they represent linearly independent cycles. Now, I never worked with surfaces of genus more than 10,000s. And for genus 15,000s, this 0.62 log G is still less than six. So basically, even if you take a surface of very large genus, then a random multi-curve on it has one, two, three, four, five, or six connected components with a very large probability. So this is first result. And as a matter of fact, uh, this implies that for square tile surfaces, uh, a random all conical singularities, all, all critical points of a square tile surfaces, points where you have glued more than four squares, six, eight, and so on. Uh, I assume that there are no conical similarities of angle pi. They all live at the very same level, which is exactly opposite to intuition of Morse theory when all critical points like to live on different levels. Here, all of them are in the same level with a very high probability. One more question is about coefficients. What can be said about this coefficients m1, etc., mk of random uh, multicurve? If you fix the number of components of a multicurve and let the genus tend to infinity, for example, you can see the multicurve uh, with 26 components. And you ask, what are the typical weights, M1, et cetera, MK, M M26? Then with probability, which tends to one, all of them would be equal to one. But this is sort of a conditional probability. We assume that our multicurve has 26 components. If you do not impose it, and if you consider all possible multicurves, then the probability that your multicurve, abstract multicurve, is primitive on the nose that all this M1, M2, et cetera, and K are equal to one is tends to square root of two over two, which is approximately 70%. And we have analogous result. What is the probability that all these coefficients are less than two, less than three, et cetera. And finally, the very last slide, the main technical tool which we use is the following. So I already tied random square tile surfaces to random multicurves. Actually, both of them can be related to random permutations. One can define a very explicit probability distribution on the set of permutations, which is non-uniform, but very explicit. And then consider random permutations of larger and larger number of elements and compute the as a random variable, consider the number of cycles in the cyclic decomposition of this random permutation. Uh, random permutation are very well started, studied, it's, and in particularly mm, in the last years. And these results allow us to tell everything about the distribution of our random variable, the number of components of random multicurve, or number of cylinders in the random square tile surface. Here is result of four uh, mean value and for variance, we have 
explicit formula for uh, for all cumulants and the keyword for approximation of the corresponding probability distribution is mod plus on convergence, but I'm already out of time, so I don't want to, to take more time. Sorry for, for being late. Thank you for your attention. Uh, any questions, please? Maybe I can ask a soft question. So this uh, Thurston metric and the integer points in this uh, cone thing, how can I understand this better? It's sort of similar to this sphere shape polyhedra paper by Thurston, but probably more difficult. And, and I don't know, is there any source? Mm. Well, one source is introduction to the paper of Mariam. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I understand <laughs> it is collapsed to, to like two and a half pages, but actually everything is there in a sense, uh, but I'm cheating. Uh, well, to understand this better, you have to one of the words which I do not didn't pronounce and which is which should be pronounced is train coordinates. And now to being more seriously, I the best, the absolutely best introduction to train tracks, to train tracks, which I know, is a chapter of the book of Farb and Margalit, a primer on the mapping class group. It is, I think it's chapter 12, and it considers one very particular case. It considers simple closed curves on four function sphere. And everything is extremely explicit there. And you just, you can see everything. And all the structure, the, you, you having read this paper, you already feel the structure very well. Just, it's, it's a phase transition before reading this chapter and after reading this chapter. The chapter is completely elementary. You do not need to read first 11 chapters at all. You can start from this chapter 12. It is open. You can find PDF file, I think, on web pages of, of, of the authors. And it's, it's sort of, it's, it's definitely present on the web. So I suggest to read about these train tracks coordinates. And basically, when you have read this, you can, I'm cheating, of course. You, so another word is space of measured laminations and so on, but you do not need to know about measured laminations. You need to know in a sense only about integer points, integral points. Mm -hmm. Basically 90% of information, you, you already have perfect feeling after, after reading this, this chapter of, of Farben and Mar Margalit. And there is a forthcoming force, a source, which I do not know yet well, but I know that Mm -hmm. Viveka Erlandson and Juan Souto uh, have read a book which is not on archive, but I think that if you will ask the authors, they would be happy to provide you with their with the book and you would be a sort of a test reader. And this is a comprehensive information. I think that everything, everything should be there because it is mm, devoted to geodesic currents and to all these counting results. So it's many, many pages in, in all details on, on this subject. So this is the first two ideas, three ideas. So the, the shortest is, is the paper, the introduction to the paper of Mariam, then train tracks coordinates, chapter 12 of Farb and Margalit and their unpublished book of Erlandson and Soto. Thanks. Okay. Sounds very helpful. More questions?